You know, it's very special to be part of a event like this that is really Tikkun Olam, or repairing the world, that benefits sick kids. And we appreciate the opportunity to be part of this and part of everything that you're doing at Prime Quadrant and in Toronto. So as an old Chinese curse says, may you live in interesting times. We're in an era of great challenge, environmentally, socially, but we also stand at the door of great promise with technology and massive global change. The key is how intentional we are and what, whether we'll be part of the solution. And that's really what IX is about. And what we want to bring here today is opportunity and solutions that really, truly can change the world. So IX is a function, it's a formula. I is for the individual. X is for the unknown quantity or quality of your life and the impact of your dollars. So what we believe is that we can create with our investors, with this future of finance, the opportunity to solve some of the world's largest problems by deploying catalytic capital and doing it in a positive manner. So I want to cue a video that gives you a sample of our approach and what we're trying to solve for. Thank you. So big ideas solve big problems. And a lot was talked today about Columbia and value investing. And my colleague and my friend, Bill Emick, is going to talk about social value investing. Thank you, Bill. So good afternoon. Um, I'm a faculty member, so I can't sit down. I'm sorry. I, if you could cue the, I'll do a very brief, I promise, PowerPoint. Uh, but the bottom line is, is a story of life that I think we all have great stories in our life. 
And so many, I believe in God, I always have, and one of the reasons why I believe in it is so many ridiculous things have happened in my life that there must be some force up there just smiling all the time as he manipulates me and others of us around. And one of the more current stories was 2006. In the spring of 2006, Warren Buffett announced that he would be giving away all of the money he had accumulated in his lifetime uh, to Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation and his three children. Momentous day, I think a day that will be remembered in history. And that fall, as I taught my regular course, which is filled not quite this big, but lots of people in the room about management, I didn't know that there was a young man in the room whose name was Howard W. Buffett. And I, I tend to be a fairly, um, I don't know, straightforward. And as I was talking about what great things could be accomplished and how terrible situations like New York City could be turned around and become a great place, I said, that's why I love living here. I can't imagine why anyone would live, and again, I think God put the words in my mouth. I said, I can't imagine why anyone would live in Nebraska. <laughs> so I finished the lecture, and at the end of the lecture, Howard came up to me and he said, Professor, that was really an inspiring lecture. I'm so glad I decided to come to Columbia. But I'm from Nebraska, and I really like it. And I, was, I felt so, he was so sincere, and so, I had no idea who he was. Flash forward, a year later, he walks into my office and says, Professor, I want to thank you so much. You gave me so much. I learned so much, but I'm, I'm leaving. I said, it's a two-year program. What do you mean you're leaving? He said, well, they won't let me take courses in value investing and everything else, so I'm going. I said, Howard, transfer to my program. I'll let you take whatever you want, which he did. And over the last 12 years, he and I have spent a good portion of our life trying to figure out how the lessons of value investing and the success of Berkshire Hathaway could be translated into a philosophy and a vehicle that could make the world a better place. I'm surrounded by millennials, right? And so one thing I can tell you about them from the last 25 years is they're no different than the rest of us, except that they believe they can have it all. They believe they can have a great personal life, and they can have a lot of money, and they can every day make the world a better place. And they're all really smart. And after a while, and Howard's one of them, I said, I, I think you probably are right. Let's figure out how to do it. And that's really what IX is about, and that's really what I want to talk to you briefly about in the book. If any of it makes any sense to you, read the book. If they're all gone, send me an email, I'll send you one. You don't have to buy it. Believe me, when you work with an academic press, you don't make any money. It's about sending a message to the world. So what is the message? And now this is not going to work. There we go. So basically, what is social value investing? It's taking value investing and adding to it social impact. That's it. And again, if you would like the slides, I promise I'll send them to you. But it's the same philosophy as Berkshire Hathaway. It's finding complementary investments finding great managers. One of the things I love about Berkshire Hathaway is when they buy a company, they keep the management. They keep the people. You buy a company that you believe in, and you give them the capital they need to make it work. That's the philosophy that we're building this idea upon. And you look at, as we heard time and time again today, you look for things that are undervalued. One of the things that we did not hear today, and one of the things you hear when people are critical of impact investing is, you can't manage with your head in two places. You can't think about making money and making the world a better place, and how do you balance them? And I think that's because we've been going down, at least to some degree, the wrong track. If you want to solve things like affordable housing, or inequality, or poverty, or access to health or education, Private sector companies cannot do it alone. But nor can government and nor can charities. 
where, we're, where we haven't started to think is, how do we combine the strengths and the abilities of organizations from all three sectors? By the way, some family offices represent all three sectors. How do we bring these sectors together to solve these intractable problems? And the book is not just about theory, it's about stories, which I'm just gonna give you a couple of quick flashes on, of how this is happening already in the world. That's the traditional way we look at society. There's the public sector, the private sector, and the social sector, and they each have their jobs to do. What we say is there's a space where those three circles come together, where you can establish collaborative cross-sector partnerships to solve these big problems. And there are five principles in the book. It's about process, it's about people, it's about place, it's about portfolio, which is mixed investment, and it's about measuring impact. And just quickly, you may not have known about this before, but I strongly recommend you pursue these stories. One is in India. India has started a system called ADHAR. It's a national biometric ID card which not only qualifies you for everything in the public sector, like voting, like school, like benefits, but it's also becoming the go-to ID for getting a cell phone, or doing your banking, or getting medical care from a hospital. It's the one single ID where you can store all your documents. Today, there are all over 1.2 billion people in India who have that biometric ID card. And it was made possible because it was an idea from the government which for two decades they tried to implement and they couldn't. They partnered with the tech sector, they got the local community involved in them. Four years, they got to 1.2 billion and they're going still. It's changing India. And there is state of the art telemedicine where the best neurosurgeons in the world actually diagnose patients in the most rural part of India as part of this entire system. It's just amazing. Read the story. It's there. It works. If you've been to New York City in the 80s and today, you know that. And if you haven't, watch some movies. I grew up there. Central Park was the most dangerous place in New York City in the 80s and 90s. You took your life in your hands if you went there. Today, 42 million visitors every year. It's the most visited tourist attraction in the Northeast of the United States. It's a public park run by a private entity. The High Line, the same thing. Not only run, they pay for it. I got so much in here, and my colleagues have a lot more to say. When we go to Brazil, you'll see examples of where cross-sector partnerships went wrong, the Rio Olympics, but you'll also see one of the most spectacular museums in the world, which not only is a great museum about climate change, but it also transformed the neighborhood because of the investments it caused in one of the worst neighborhoods in Rio. Well, you can have these slides if you want it. But the last part of the book, which is being operationalized at IX, is what we call the impact rate of return. And it's a mathematical formula that allows potential investors to pro project forward the impact per dollar invested at a range of options in a field, whether it's in real estate, or in climate, or in an example that's in the book, in fire safety. There is revolutionary approach to fire safety in New York City, which was made possible by a public-private partnership. So that's kind of the, the background of the book. The book, I think, in part, led to IX, and I'll turn it over to my colleagues to, to give you the real story. Thank you. Sarah, would you... Uh, with that introduction before, would you just oh, give us a synopsis? Just, yeah, stop. Yeah. Well, first of all, I could listen to Bill all day. I mean, these examples are just absolutely breathtaking. And um, I want to say, though, a little bit about how I came to IX and sort of my take on this. So. Um, 
as Mo indicated. I uh, had the pleasure, really, the honor of serving both as a, a governor on the Federal Reserve Board and as the Deputy Secretary of the Treasury. So in these capacities, I, I really did um, share in having my hands on the two very important levers, um, at least in the U.S. economy, um, that being the lever of monetary policy and the lever of um, fiscal policy, and I say fiscal, structural, regulatory policy. And of course, these levers were inordinately uh, necessary during the financial crisis. I served as a governor on the Fed board from um, 2010 to 2014, and then um, was uh, asked to go uh, be the number two at Treasury um, in 2014, and stayed there from 2014 to 2017. And. Um, You'll remember, of course, what those years were. I mean, those were the years where, um, you know, the, the, the heat of the financial crisis had subsided, um, but it was clear that uh, there had been quite significant damage, and there was quite a lot of work that had to be done to get the economy moving again. Economies around the world uh, had essentially um, stalled out. So while massive accommodation had occurred in the heat of the crisis, um, it turned out that a lot more had to be done um, in the aftermath of the crisis in order to bring the economy uh, back to some sense of normalcy. And you'll also recall those years um, were characterized by a sense that there were a lot of new policies that had to get tried, right? You'll remember QE, right? QE1, QE2. I mean, these were massive amounts of quantitative easing that the Federal Reserve uh, was engaging in. And these were, you know, frankly, not particularly well-tested theories, uh, but they were, in essence, policy choices that had to get made because of the severity and the uh, widespread nature of the financial crisis. You'll also recall that there was massive amounts in the trillions worth of dollars of global liquidity that had to be provided and that was provided through currency swap lines between the Fed and, um, and the central banks of other countries. Um, so the massive scale, really, of the financial crisis was one that um, I would say really seared me, uh, was one that made me realize, you know, whose recovery was this anyway? There were sections, and there continue to be massive sections of our economy that really are not working as they should. We see industries that still need significant, uh, significant uh, means to propel themselves forward. We have huge swaths of discouraged people who are not even counted in the unemployment statistics. So from a macro perspective, you know, things look pretty good. From a micro perspective, when you dig in, you see some of the fault lines. And um, it's really these fault lines that uh, drew me to a vehicle like IX. So the, these issues having to do with the lack of affordable housing, the lack of green investing, massive amounts of wealth and income inequality, gender imbalances, we have a lot of issues that need to get addressed. And despite all the massive and unprecedented work that was done in the financial crisis, we really didn't do much to solve some of these underlying issues. And that's really where the idea of IX comes from. And, you know, Bill, Howard, and Steve is just, you know, essential to this effort, have been some of the thought leaders that have put forth an idea that we can actually do better. And we can do better in a way that 
provides no cut on returns. And this is what is so propelling about the IX idea, which is that you don't need to take a cut in market returns. The, the idea traditionally, and you'll know this, Steve, you know, the old line view was like, okay, you can do good for the world, but you're going to pay for it somehow. <laughs> and now what we're seeing is absolutely the opposite. Research study after research study is coming out and showing that you can invest intentionally, you can make an impact, and you can still reach your bottom line and even do better. I'll stop there, no, though, Bill. Sarah, but, but why now? What, what is it about either the investors or the environment that has caused this change? So I think that's it's a great question. I think, I think we're at a, a really interesting inflection point now. Uh, for the one thing, you've got, you know, what Bill talked about earlier, the millennials. You know, I've got three of them as children, <laughs> and they, <laughs> they are really quite demanding about what is going to move the needle for them in terms of being able to, to be active participants in the economy. So they really believe, as do, you know, we now see study after study on millennials, that, 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 that businesses can actually do better. They, they need to make profits, but they actually need to make impact, too. And they need to make a positive impact. And, the, and the, the millennials are demanding this. I mean, many of you may have them, you know, at your firms. Uh, you may have them built into your missions. The mission now of doing something positive and aligning your investment portfolios with that sense of positive social impact is at a scale I frankly have not seen historically. Yeah. Maybe it is, you know, maybe it is this idea that you know, government has somehow let them down. Maybe it is the sense that government can't solve the problems alone. But for whatever reason, there is this sense that now is the moment. Bill, are we at a structural point where companies and the investment world and government are tr changing the view? I think this has been an evolution. I think those of you who look at it at all is that you know, public PPPs uh, are pretty commonly known. And for 30, almost 40 years, government has engaged the private sector to help accomplish things like roads or bridges or desalinization plants that traditionally were government projects done by government workers. All over time, people said, well, maybe we can accomplish that more efficiently and effectively by bringing the private sector in. So that was the beginning of this kind of collaborative effort. But what didn't change is government thought of the project, government planned the project, and then basically contracted with the private sector to implement it. What we've evolved to, I think, now is that if everyone comes to the table to deal with infrastructure problems, income inequality, housing, which is a field I know very well. I know Sam is a little bit skeptical, but I think he thinks of the old world, not the new world. In the new world, if you think about it, affordable housing is not that difficult if the government sits down with the private sector and the community and says, we need this array of housing. We have assets like land. We have some money. We have communities. You want zoning. Look at the story of the High Line. It was one of the worst neighborhoods in New York. It is now the number one family neighborhood in New York. Yep. It has an asset that gets 10 million visitors a year, and there's 2,000 units of public low-income housing right next to it. And within the new buildings that were built, 20 to 30 percent of the units are affordable to people of working class and below. It's, it's being done. What we're, I think, what we're pitching is you can do these things at scale once people get to understand how it works. And, and technologies change too, Bill. I yes, mean, there's absolutely. methods of construction absolutely. that provide housing that are, that are the ability to live in housing that you'd want to live in and do it efficiently. And on top of that, do it conserving energy, water, and having an impact in the neighborhood. And all making returns. I mean, Sarah, you, you mentioned it. You can achieve top tier returns without having to concede. So what are some of the areas that, that you believe 
you can deploy capital in. Sure. So first of all, I want you know I really want that to be a big takeaway, Steve, because again, I think we are at this inflection point where 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 people are now realizing that you don't have to give up returns in order to 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 make a positive social impact, and that I think is just um, opening now the the doors and the opportunities for a whole host of extraordinary returns and doing massive social good at the same time. But, I, you know, ideas for where we're seeing it. I mean, one, one area, of course, is, you know, in the realm of, of climate change. I mean, we can now take a building, uh, buy it, we can green it, green it up top to bottom, you know, end to end, reduce the carbon footprint, and essentially have created value. And that's a value that, you know, with, with Howard and Bill's methodology, we can, we can attempt to quantify. And it's, it's really actually quite something. Another issue, you know, we have, we've seen in, in parts of the world where, where there's really poor access to medical care. Right? We can now take a, uh, a company and we, we can offer you know, a, a contraceptive method, a birth control pill, over the counter for regions of, of people who don't have access to medical care and can't actually go in and, and find a doctor and get a, a prescription, but people who still want to plan their families. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, so this kind of, this kind of uh, you know, of, of endeavor is one that people are so interested in seeing grow and seeing as part of the solutions to, you know, the so-called intractable problems in our society. And, and Bill, you mentioned, you know, affordable housing, but there are some other areas too. I mean, so, some of these things are, are if, if you didn't see it, you'd say, well, that's crazy. There's, there's a company called Waste Fuel that we're involved with that has a technology which is already proven. Again, this is happening already. The question is going to scale, which if they can get the rights to all the garbage of a city, if the city's willing to say for the next 25 years, we'll give you all your solid waste, they can build a plant, convert it into, among other things, fuel that can be used in planes. Right? Which is a valuable commodity. This can be a very profitable endeavor. In fact, there are even different uses for garbage. Houston, Texas was able to get a private firm to build a, a plant that processes all their garbage for free because the value of the garbage once processed is enough to cover the cost. So, I, the, I, but I think again, I take you back to, it's a partnership. The private firm can't do it by itself. You can't turn garbage into waste fuel or useful products unless they have the supply of garbage from the municipality, cooperation from the local people to say, we'll accommodate this in our community. There's always spinoffs, but collaboratively. Absolutely, and you look at the, the kind of way that capital can be deployed in a plant like that. It's early stage where you're doing feasibility, where you're putting the, the kind of development together and you need that partnership need the government, you need those long-term commitments. And then there's structured finance and green bonds are available for this. And if you think about the measurable impact, it's cleaning up festering garbage dumps. And we've all seen the pictures where people are living and, you know, and especially in non-developed countries, people are living in these garbage dumps and they don't recycle because it's not part of the industrial complex there. And then on the other end, the ability to drop in jet fuel and reduce the carbon footprint of a flight by 60%, measurable, scalable impact with real returns along the continuum of early stage, structured finance, and then yielding as the plant is moving forward. You know, Steve, you might be um, leading us to the question of, of, you know, IX. Like, what is it about the IX um, structure mm -hmm. that essentially aligns well with what I think a lot of people here may be interested in, which is, of course, the, the, the way families invest, right? So I'd like to hear you talk about it, but my sense is, you know, that there is this very close synergy that exists between the family 
and the family's desire to bring about a, um, a good set of outcomes for the money that it has made. And, and something, and, and the way IX does things. But you, you yeah. tell us about that. It, if you think, I've been working with families and had the honor and pleasure to do it for over 30 years. And if you think about families, it's long-term asset owners. It's intentionality with the capital. It's opportunistic. And most of you act like a holding company anyways. You've got an entity and you've got philanthropic entities and you're deploying capital into opportunities, whether they be public or private. And what we've done is we've said the same thing. We have 35 families that are shareholders at the holding company level, the homage, if you would, to Berkshire, except we don't have an insurance company balance sheet and, <laughs> and that and public stock. But the idea is that you can do long-term things. You can be opportunistic. You can seed early stage ventures. You can do more yielding things. You can take the capital and say, this is where I choose to deploy it over this time period and do the due diligence and be able to say, everything should be belts and suspenders. You should be able to look at this like any other investment. It's just that you're choosing to deploy your capital, and we call them areas of interest. And as we've alluded to, it's green real estate, it's renewables, it's gender equality, it's fair finance, it's affordable housing, all these things where technology and partnerships can deliver returns in a way that can compound over time. Not just compounding the returns, but compounding the impact, possibly multi-generationally, if we do this right. So we've only got a, a, a couple more minutes, five minutes I think uh, we have, and I just want to talk about the importance of the standard for impact measurement. And I do a lot of work with universities, and so many of them now are, they're actually teaching courses at the MBA level on impact investing, sustainability. And one of the big puzzles that has to be solved is a standard of measurement that you can understand, observe, and report what the impact of your dollars are. So Bill, you mentioned it earlier. Just give us a sense of where this is going and what the world needs in that realm. So most of you are familiar with this either from the business side or, or from your family foundation side. We have we have honed our measurement of financials and outcomes pretty well over the last 50 years. So we have pretty good measurements to make a judgment about how well we're doing financially, how well we're doing in terms of business outcomes. The field of measuring social impact is, is pretty young. And there are a lot of good people who have done a lot of good work. And again, in the book, you'll see a lot of what the progress that has been made is, is there. And it's good, and it's getting better. The one limitation of it is it always looks backwards. That is, it looks at, so we made this investment, we have this project. This is what's happened. This is how good we did. What it doesn't address is, what if you're saying, well, now I want to get involved. I want to get involved in affordable housing. There are lots of different options out there. How do I decide which one? Or how do I decide whether I want to invest in housing or health care or education? The formula that's outlined in the book, and it also runs through four examples for you to take a look at in, in real estate, in agriculture, in public safety is to say, let's look at three or four different options and let's see if we can project per dollar invested what the impact is likely to be, all by the same standard and all customized by the quality that you, the user, input into the formula. The best parallel I can give you is the lead standards in, in environmental uh, soundness that architects use, so there's platinum, there's gold. That black box of quality is something the user customizes to meet their needs. It's easier to 
comprehend and understand if you read the chapter. And again, if you don't want the book, I'll send you a copy of the chapter. <laughs> but what it does then is allow you to compare on a level playing field in dollar terms, how much dollar impact do I get from each one of these four investments, say, within agriculture, or how much of an impact in dollar terms in agriculture compared to sustainability. So, and, and what you're doing there just is... one last yeah, thing, just please. one last thing. It's a projection, right? It's not necessarily actual. You find out over time, but at least you're comparing apples to apples and you're looking forward, not backward. It's just a beginning, it's just a prototype, but I think it's the right direction. So. And our, our premise is you start with finding out if it's a good investment first. If you're intentional on in the area of interest and it's got the IRR, investment rate of return, and the multiple on capital that you're focused on, then you move to trying to determine which one of these is going to have the most impact for the dollars I'm investing. And that's really the, the kind of modus operandi and the measurement we're trying to bring in the discipline we're deploying. So as we only have a couple minutes to close, Sarah, why don't you talk about what you think the future of finance is? Uh, in, in one minute. In one minute, yeah. <laughs> 30 seconds. Well, I'll tell you one part of the future of finance. I mean, one part of it is it's going to have to figure out a way to bring about more inclusive prosperity. Uh, that, to me, is the defining challenge, really, of what lies ahead for us. IX, I think, is onto something, you know, extraordinary here, uh, but obviously it's going to take it's going to take more, and it's going to uh, just take a level of intentionality that I think we have not yet seen to date, but that is one that um, I think with the, right, um, with the right spirit, with the right methodology, with the right intentions, we will achieve. Bill, what's the future look like to you? To me, I'm very optimistic uh, because I know we can do all these things. I think it's just a realization of more and more people that we're all in this together. Our society depends on all of us doing our role. And at least in the United States, we're, we're in a period where everything that's wrong is blamed on the other side. And that's not the way a society moves forward. You can disagree about how you get to the right answer, but you gotta work together on the right answers. And I, I, I've been around long enough. We've ebbed and flowed. I think we're headed in the right direction. And, and again, giving people the option to do good for themselves as well as do good for others, I think that's going to be the, the... So great academic thought has always ushered in new eras of society and finance. Uh, we're all familiar with Adam Smith, and in 1776 when he wrote The Wealth of Nations, it created a framework for prosperity of the developed and the developing world. And it really created the, the field of economics and all the things that we believe markets can and cannot do. Lesser known was his prior work in 1759 called The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And we believe that that thought is worth recapturing from The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And I'll close with a couple quotes from that book. How selfish soever man may be supposed, there are evidently some principles in his nature which interest him in the fortune of others and render their happiness necessary to him, though he derives nothing from it except the pleasure of seeing it. The opposite of schadenfreude, by the way. The most sacred laws of justice are the laws which guard the life and person of our neighbor. We're at the beginning of the future of what we believe is finance and some great opportunity for positive change in society. May you live in interesting times. Thank you. Thank you.